We have already talked about binomial distributions a little bit. Um, you actually had some questions on this for flipping coins, um, guessing on a multiple choice test, where we use very small numbers for the binomial distribution. So quick review, four conditions to check. The trials must be independent. The number of trials is fixed. Each trial is classified as a success or failure. This is where before we said there are two possible outcomes. And that the probability of success is the same for each trial. Um, we used this formula to calculate the probability of having the um, K successes in N trials, where this NK, um, in your calculator, it's NCK. Um, so we've used this formula before. The new formulas that we have not used yet are to find the mean, variance, and standard deviation of a binomial distribution. Okay, so the mean is the number of trials times the probability of success. Okay, the mean is the number of trials times the probability of success. The variance is the mean times the probability of success times the probability of failure. And we find the standard deviation by taking the square root of the variance. Okay. So now on a coin flipping thing, or guessing on a you know a certain number of questions on a test, we can figure out what our expectation is. The mean, another mean, if you see the word expected or expectation. They are asking you to find the mean of a distribution. Okay. So we're going to be using these formulas and going over some binomial distribution stuff. And then we are going to extend because sometimes, so it's not too bad if I just want to know exactly getting uh, what the probability of getting five heads is. But if I want to get the probability, let's say I flip a coin a hundred times and I want to know what the probability of getting between 48 and 65 heads are, that's a lot of times to do this binomial distribution formula in the calculator. So we're going to learn some tools today to help us um, work around that. So first step is always to make sure that your model is appropriate. That means it doesn't vary. Do we have the four um, conditions to use the bi um, binomial distribution. Then you need to identify your N, your P, and your K. The N is the trials. The P is the probability of success. And the K is how many? How many out of your trials? And then we're going to use software or the formulas to determine our answers. Okay, um, so out of your textbook, the whole chapter four, if you go four, one, four, two, four, three, a lot of their guided questions, they're talking about an insurance agency where 70% do not exceed their deductible. So I copied that from earlier in the chapter so that we can answer these types of questions. So if we randomly sample 40 case files from an insurance agency, that meets these requirements above, how many cases would you expect to not have a succeeded deductible in a given year? Keyword here is expect. That is mu. What is the standard deviation of that number that would not have exceeded the deductible? So again, we need to make sure that it meets the criteria. Okay, we have a fixed number of trials. 40, N is 40. The probability of success is the same for each of them. 
That's point seven. Um, each one is independent um, because as we're going to make that assumption. Sometimes we're going to talk a little bit later that this one may not necessarily be independent because two of the individuals may actually be living together um, and both have individual insurance, that type of thing. But we're going to assume that they're independent. And um, the last one, yes, it's a successor or a failure. They either exceed or they do not exceed. In this case, success means do not exceed deductible. Sorry about the clicking. So I want to find the standard deviation. Uh, first thing I want to do is I want to find the mean. The mean from the previous page is the number of trials times the probability of success. So we had 40 people times the probability of success, which was 0.7, which is 28. Real quick calculation. Then it asks what the standard deviation is. Well, the standard deviation is the square root of n times the probability of success times the probability of failure. So it's the square root of 40 times 0.7 times 0.3. And that is a calculator question. So I'm going to just type that in the calculator. Second square root 40 times 0.7 times 0.3. And I get 2.90. I rounded it to two decimal points. It was 2.898. So these formulas for mean, variance, and standard deviation are only used if you, ha if you have a binomial distribution type problem. And we have other formulas for mean, variance, and standard deviation for other types of problems. Okay, so we had a mean of 28 and a standard deviation of 2.9. Another ex example, the probability that a random smoker will develop severe lung condition in his or her lifetime is about 0.3. If you have four friends who smoke, are the conditions for the binomial model satisfied? So conditions, um, I'm going to if there is one that is not satisfied, please type it in chat. I'm going to write down the conditions. Um, the first one is fixed number of trials. The second one, um, probability of success is fixed. Third one, each trial independent. And the fourth one, um, it's either success or failure. So if there's any of them in here that you think may not be met, please type it in chat. You guys, a couple seconds to think. Okay, fixed number of trials. Okay. In this case, yes. I have four friends. Probability of success is fixed. They're telling me that it is. It's about 0.3 for the population. Success or failure? Success in this case is severe lung condition. And a failure is no severe lung condition. I like to write down what success means in words. Okay. Now, 
This is where things can get sketchy. If two of your friends live together, they can be impacted mo more than, um, uh, let's make it even easier. If, for, if two of your friends are friends of each other, they could smoke together at the same time and have more smoke than if they were not friends with each other. So this one is a maybe. Okay. So because that independence thing, we really don't know if we're doing a large survey because people could be living together. They can have influence on each other. They could be friends of each other, that type of thing, exerting other peer pressure. We are going to say each trial, we're going to assume each trial is independent unless we tell you otherwise on things like this. Okay, there's going to be some times that you're going to be able to definitely tell that things are dependent. On your first test, we had one of the mosaic charts where we were talking about Democrats and raising taxes. And the Democrats block was really, really big compared to the Republicans one. So that, that shows that there's definitely a dependence. However, that was not a binomial distribution. So when we're doing our binomial distributions, a lot of times the each trial being independent is a maybe. We're gonna make the assumption that they are independent and make a note that, hey, we did assume that they were independent unless told otherwise. And we're gonna be able to tell if they're not independent directly. Now, suppose these friends do not know each other. That's going to guarantee that we're independent in this case. And we can treat them as a random sample. Is the binomial model appropriate? In this case, it would be a yes. What is the probability that none of them will develop a severe lung condition? So there are four of them. We want none of them to have that severe lung condition. So that's what I would type in my calculator. Okay, if you type that into the calculator, remember the C, if you want to get that C in there, first thing you're going to do is you're going to type the four, then you're going to go to math, then you're going to go over to probability, so I'm going to type in the four, math, go over to probability, and then you're going to go down to the NCR button, and then you're going to type enter, and then you're going to type the zero. And after you type the zero, you need to use the right arrow key to get out from underneath that NCR. And then this point three to the zero, after you type the zero there, you're going to use the right arrow key, and the point seven to the one, you use a right arrow key. So point three to the zero, which I don't even have to put in there, and then point seven to the zero. What is the probability that none of them are true zero? Oh, it's not 0.7 to the zero, it's 0.7 to the four. Number of failures. I knew something was wrong with my answer. So four, enter 0 0.2401. So there's a 24.01% chance that none of them will get a severe lung condition. For the one, it would be 4C1, 0.3 to the one, and 0.7 to the three. I'm gonna use a red pen to separate that. So again, I hit four math probability, go down to my NCR, hit one, Use a right arrow times 0.3 to the one, which I don't even have to do. I can just do 0.3 times 0.7 to the three. And this is 0.4116. And then no more than one will develop a severe lung condition. No more than one means either zero or one. And we learned from our chapter one test, this is the probability of getting zero plus the probability of getting one. So I'm just going to add those two numbers together, 
0.2401 plus 0.4116 is 0.6517. So get used to using the calculator, okay? Um, that NCR button using this binomial distribution and the uh, the normal distribution from the last lesson, you need to get used to using the calculator on those. It should not take you minutes to do one of these problems. It should take you less than a minute to type this into the calculator and um, come up with the answer. So guided practice, the next one. What is the probability that at least two of your smoking friends will develop a severe lung condition? Well, that means I have two, three, or four. So let's think about the possibilities. I can have zero, one, two, three, or four of my friends having a severe lung condition. I do not need to put, I don't need to calculate, like I calculated the zero and the one, I don't need to calculate the two, three, and four and add those up because I know this amount is 0.6517 and the total amount has to add up to one. So to figure out the at least two, three, or four, I'm gonna go one minus the 0.6517 and get 0.3483. Now there's nothing wrong with you putting the two into the formula, the three into the formula, the four into the formula and adding them up, okay? But like C, I already had the two pieces of information I needed to calculate C. On this one, I already had what zero and one were, so I know the fact that the entire probability has to add up to one, why do the extra work in the calculator if you don't need to? So read questions carefully so you're not doing extra work. Suppose you have seven friends who are smokers and they can be treated as a random sample of smokers. How many would you expect to develop a severe lung condition? I.e., what is the mean? The mean is the number of trials times the probability of success, which is seven. Success is a severe lung condition, and that's 0.3, which is 2.1. What is the probability that at most two of your seven friends develop a severe lung condition? That means zero get it, one get it, or two get it. Okay, so in this case, because of the tools that we have, I need to do three of those formulas in the calculator. I need to do 7C0, 0, 0.3 to the 0, 0.7 to the 7. I need to do 7C1, 0.3 to the 1, 0.7 to the 6, and 7C2, 0.3 to the 2, 0.7 to the 5. Do all of those three to four decimal points. So I'm going to go 7C0, 0 times 0.3 to the 0. I'm just typing the ones in that I, even the zeros, because I'm just going to go back and fill in the blanks in my calculator for the other ones. So times 0.7 to the 7. This is 0 0.0824. And I'm going to go up and edit. I'm going to change that 7 to a 6, that 0 to a 1, and that 0 to a 1. This is 0 0.2471. And if I were actually going to be doing this for a whole bunch of different things, I would abuse the properties of spreadsheets that let me copy and paste formulas. 
so that I could do it um, without having to type it into the calculator a whole bunch of times. So if you're going to do a whole bunch of statistics for some some sort of binomial distribution and you want to know what all of these numbers are, the best thing to do would probably be to use a spreadsheet until we come up with a shortcut. So I'm going to add all three of those together, 0 0.0824 plus 0 0.2471 plus 0 0.3177. And I get 0.6472. That at most two of my friends will develop a severe lung condition, 64.7% at most two out of the seven friends. And do another example. Approximately 15% of the U.S. population smokes. A local government believed the community had lower smoker rate and commissioned a survey of 400 randomly selected individuals. The survey found that only 42 out of the 400 smoke. So if I do 42 divided by 400, that is 10.5%. If the true proportion is really 15, what is the probability of observing 42 or fewer smokers in a sample of 400 people? Okay, with the tools we have now, I would have to find the probability for zero smokers, one smoker, two smokers, three smokers, four, five. I'd have to do this all the way up to the probability of 42 smokers. That is a lot of time. Even typing it into a spreadsheet is going to make it a lot. It's going to take a significant amount of time. But there is a way that we're going to learn to shortcut this, and we're going to come back to this question in a minute. If I increase the number of trials, so each one of these four graphs is a binomial distribution. These are binomial distribution graphs. As I increase the number of trials from 10 to 30 to 100, in this case 300, notice that the shape of the curve, as my n gets bigger and bigger, the curve looks approximately normal. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how can I use that binomial CDF function in the calculator to actually answer, uh, not the binomial CDF, but the normal CDF function in the calculator to actually answer some binomial questions. Especially ones like this one on the previous page where I'd have to do 43 different probability calculations and add them all up. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that if I increase the number of samples, it can get to the point where it's approximately normal. So we have some new rules. Okay. A binomial distribution with a probability of success is nearly normal when the sample size is sufficiently large such that the number of trials times the probability of success is greater than or equal to 10 and the number of trials times the probability of failure is greater than or equal to 10. If this is the case, we can use the mean formula and the standard deviation formula that I gave you previously in this lecture and approximate it with normal distribution. So first thing I need to do is I need to actually calculate whether my sample size is large enough. So in P, I'm going to check that. In is 400. Probability of success in this case is 0.15, which means they're a smoker. Put that into the calculator and see if it's greater than or equal to 10. So 400 times 0.15 is 60. That's definitely greater than or equal to 10. And then the number of trials times the probability of failure 1 minus P 
is 400 times 0.85. And I will guarantee that this one's more than 10 because 8.85 is more than 0.15. But just for our number, I get 340, which is greater than or equal to 10. Because both of these are greater than or equal to 10, I can use my normal distribution facts with a mu of NP. Well, we've already calculated what NP was, it was 60. And then my standard deviation is the square root of N times P times one minus P which is the square root of 400 times 0.15 times 0.85. So 400 times 0.15 times 0.85. And then take the square root of that. And I get 7.14. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use my calculator. And in my calculator, I'm gonna do the normal distribution with a mu of 60 and a standard deviation of 7.14. So I'm gonna hit distribution, normal CDF. Um, what is the probability of 42 or fewer? I told you that anytime I'm doing a normal thing in the calculator, I need to kind of give myself a picture. I know the middle is 60. They're asking me about 42, and they want to know 42 or less than. So I, I now know which region I'm looking for. I'm looking for a very small number up to 42. So lower is negative 1e e to the 99. Upper 42, mu is 60, and standard deviation is 7.14. Paste that into my wonderful calculator, 0 0.0059. So here's the thing. What it's telling me is that there is less than a 1% chance that you can survey 400 people and only 42% of them smoke, okay? There's a less than 1% chance. Well, the, the government believes that they actually have a lower smoking rate than the rest of the population. So it's not that 10% is less than 15%, it's not that the 10% that we calculated, the 42 out of 400 is smaller than the 15% that shows that that local government is um, more than likely correct. It's that there is less than a 1% probability of randomly surveying 400 smokers and getting, I mean, 400 people and getting 42 or less smokers. So, when you are getting ready for our test two and some of the homework questions, when we calculate 42 out of 400, we got about 10%, okay? The reason why um, this go local government, that, that, that local community does have a lower smoker rate probably is not that 10% is less than 15%, it's because the likelihood of getting 42 out of 400 is very, very, very small. Anything less than 1% is definitely not very likely to happen. What, oh, we're gonna go back to uh, Guessing questions on a test. What is the approximate probability of correctly guessing at least 20 questions out of 50 on a true or false test? Well, let's see. My N is 50. Um, my number of successes in this case is 20. And my probability of success is 0 0.5. And guessing on true or false question number two has no impact on what my guess on true or false question number three is. So it is a success or failure thing. 
Well, at least 20 means I'd have to do 20, 21, 22, 23, all the way up to 50 um, questions using that binomial distribution formula. Let's see if I can approximate this as normal. So first thing I want to know is what NP is. 50 times 0.5. So on 50 times 0.5 is 25. Well, N times 1 minus P is going to again be 50 times 0.5. Both of those are more than 10, so I'm going to approximate it with a normal. And if I'm approximating it with a normal, I need to calculate the mu and the standard deviation. Mu is NP, which we already have is 25. The standard deviation is the square root of N times the probability of success times the probability of failure, which is the square root of 50 times 0.5 times 0.5, so square root of 50 times 0.5 times 0.5, 3.54. Need to draw my distribution curve. The middle of my curve is 25. They're asking at least 20. If I put my 20 here, and at least 20 is this region. So my lower is going to be the 20. My upper is going to be the 1e to the 99. And then I have my mu and standard deviation from above. So distribution, normal. My lower is 20. My upper is the 1e to the 99. My mu was 25. Standard deviation of 3.54. Paste that into the calculator. 92.11. So on a 50 question multiple choice test, you have a 92.92% chance of the, you have a 92% probability of guessing at least 20 of them correctly. Now, if this was a four answer multiple choice test, the, it would have been lower. Um, because you had the probability of success is lower, so you're gonna end up with a lower overall probability of getting all those right. Okay, said we could use the normal to approximate a binomial if those two conditions were met. You can straight up use that formula um, anytime you're doing a very large region that you're trying to find the area of. If you are trying to find the area of a very small region, um, the blue represents what my normal curve in the calculator is going to give me. That red group represents what the binomial actual is going to give me. Um, it says normal approximations can be improved if we lower the shaded end of the shaded region by 0.5 and the upper region by 0.5. So if I wanted to do the numbers 49 is less than my probability, which is less than 51. In my calculator, I would actually do 48.5 to 51.5. And what that's going to do is it's going to take that blue region and it's going to shade these little white rectangles in and it's going to make that approximation a lot closer. So if I ask you to compensate for a very small interval, you're always going to add 0.5 to the upper number and subtract 0.5 from the lower number for a region. Okay, and that, that's so we can get a little bit closer. I will tell you, your normal 
if, if this was the ones I was trying to find out, in this case, my normal is still going to be an underestimate. However, if I was doing one on this side of my curve, my normal would end up being an overestimate because um, no, my normal on this on the left hand side is an under. And again, my normal on this side is also going to be an under because I have those spaces. So again, these are approximations. Um, and they're going to be good enough for our work. So here's where I would use this fact. I am trying to find the probability of getting three different possibilities out of 100. That's a very small region. Okay? So I toss a coin 100 times. I want to know the probability of getting a 49, 50, or 51. First thing I need to do is check if it's a binary. And we already know that tossing a coin 100 times, that is a binary distribution, especially if we put the word fair in here, where my n is 100. My probability of success is 0.5. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find the probability of a 49 plus the probability of a 50 plus the probability of a 51. I could do this formula three times in the calculator, the NCR formula three times in the calculator, or I can see if I can approximate it as a normal. So n times p is 100 times 0.5, which is 50. n times 1 minus p is 100 times 0.5, which is 50. Both of those are more than 10. So I can approximate it with a normal curve. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find the probability because this is a small group of numbers, I'm going to subtract 0.5 from the low and add 0.5 to the high. 48.5 is less than my x, which is less than 51.5. So this will be my low in my calculator. This will be my upper in the calculator. The other two numbers I need are my mu, which is my mean, which is n times p, 100 times 0.5, which is 50, and my standard deviation, which is the square root of n times p times 1 minus p, which is the square root of 100 times a half, which is 50, times another half, which is 25, and the square root of 25 is 5. So the four things that I'm going to be using in my calculator are my lower, my upper, my mu, and my standard deviation. So I'm going to do my normal CDF. Lower is 48.5. My upper is 51.5. My mu is 50. And my standard deviation is 5. And... I get approximately 0.2358. So um, 20, almost a 24% chance of after flipping coins 100 times, you either get 49, 50, or 51. And I'd expect it to be a fairly decent number because 50, if you just go straight out, and figure out what your expected value is. Your expected value is 50, and being one away from 50 isn't you know, too bad out of there. So that is it for today. I am going to stop the video. Um, again, there is no um, office hours Thursday or Friday. So please finish up your test and get your chapter four homework working on while I still have office hours available.